Today we'll be talking about Megalodon, evolution, body size, and extinction. So really gonna get into some of the research and kind of the technical side of what we know about Megalodon. So a lot of what we're talking about today is gonna be research that I actually did during my dissertation and some research I did when I was an intern here at the Calvert Marine Museum. And I wanna remind you we're doing this lecture series to go in part with uh, our new exhibit, Sharks Sink Your Teeth In, which is up on the mezzanine level. It is open until December of next year, so if you haven't had a chance, please come back and check out the new exhibit. All right, so we're really gonna be answering three main questions tonight. First one is, who did Megalodon evolve from? The second question is, how big was Megalodon? And our last question is, when did Megalodon go extinct? Along with all three of these questions, I will give you our best guess as to why but we can't always know for sure why Megalodon evolved from a certain species or why Megalodon reached a certain size or why it went extinct, but I'll at least give you our, our best speculation for, for why for these questions. All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about, who did Megalodon evolve from? So to talk about this, we need to think about Megalodon's scientific name. So the scientific name of a species includes the genus and the species name. So for humans, Homo sapiens. The genus is Homo, the species is Sapiens. For Megalodon, the common name you'll pretty often hear is either gonna be Carcarcales Megalodon, Carcarodon Megalodon, or more recently, Otodus Megalodon. So let's talk a little bit about the history of that. So when Megalodon was first described in the 1830s, it was called Carcarodon Megalodon because it was thought to be the ancestor of the living great white shark, which is named Carcarodon carcarias. So the genus name was saying, we believe this shark is closely related to the living great white shark. In 1923, this researcher said, no, Megalodon is actually part of a different group of sharks, so we're gonna give it its own unique genus name, so instead we should call it Carcarcales Megalodon. In 1960, another researcher said, no, 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 it is related to the great white, but it's different enough that it should get its own genus, so I propose Procarcarodon Megalodon. So this is still insinuating that it's related to the great white, but it is different enough that it should get its own genus name. Closely thereafter, in 1964, someone went back to kind of Jordan's idea, saying it's a separate, it's a separate lineage of sharks, deserves its own name, Megasolachus megalodon, which translates to big shark, big tooth. Um, most likely what happened is these researchers did not see each other's study at that time. You have to imagine that uh, people in different parts of the world were all studying Megalodon, but they didn't have easy access to send those papers around the world to anybody. So most likely, the fact that these two papers came out so close to one another is the fact that they actually didn't see the other's work. So most recently, in 2012, it was suggested that we should use the genus name Otodus. So in these theories that gave Megalodon a separate lineage, they believe that Megalodon evolved from a species called Otodus obliquus. So what this researcher was saying is that uh, Megalodon is not different enough from that ancestor to warrant a different genus name, it should, it should maintain the same genus name as its ancestor. So instead, they suggested Otodus Megalodon for the name. So, there's really only two evolutionary theories here. One is that Megalodon is the ancestor of the great white shark, and the other is that Megalodon is a separate lineage. All the different genus names are just different theories about how closely related Megalodon is to those ancestors or descendants. So let's look at Megalodon and let's look at a great white shark tooth. So I'm gonna ask you all, what do you see in these images of these two teeth that you would consider similar uh, and what would you consider to be different? So please, anyone from the audience who, who would like to answer. Excellent, so they both are serrated. Uh, one seems to have larger serrations. Which one has larger serrations? It's the obvious answer, yeah. The, the, the great white seems to have larger serrations relative to the overall tooth size, right? So they're both broadly triangular and they're serrated. But there's a number of subtle details that we can look at to distinguish them. So we're just gonna go kind of from top to bottom. So first, if we look at the root, that basal root margin in Megalodon tends to be very U-shaped. But if we look over at the great white, 
the root is almost kind of rectangular or squared off and much shallower root margin. Moving down a little bit from there, you see these little dots throughout the root. Those are nutrient pores. In Megalodon, they are dispersed and fairly small, but in great whites, they tend to have one larger central nutrient pore. Moving down again, uh, between the root and the crown, we have this feature known as the burlet or a chevron, which is absent in the great white shark. If you look at the serrations of Megalodon, they're very fine and even, whereas in a great white, they are very coarse and uneven. And the maximum size of Megalodon is much larger than the maximum size of a great white shark. So with all of these different features, we can pretty confidently say that these sharks are not directly related to one another. So with that in mind, myself, and I would say most of the scientific community at this point, believes that Megalodon is not part of the great white lineage and instead belongs in this lineage known as the Megatooth shark lineage. So around 60 million years ago, this was Megalodon's ancestor, Otodus obliquus. The big difference between Otodus and Auriculatus here is serrations. So this tooth does not have a serrated edge, but this tooth does. The big difference between Carcharcholes and Otodus is basically saying that all of these sharks should be placed in the genus Otodus because the presence of serrations is not a significant enough feature to warrant a different genus. So that is the argument. You're gonna, you probably are thinking about this, why are we keep changing the name? Why are we not using Carcharcholes anymore? The reality is um, it's kind of a subtle nuance, and in my opinion, whether you say Carcharcholes megalodon or Otodus megalodon doesn't really matter to me because you are still saying it's part of the, this lineage of sharks. There's very few research questions where it's really gonna matter which genus name you put it in, but there are a few research questions where that, that could become a factor. So let's look at some other features that we see in this evolutionary progression. So overall, the maximum size of megalodon teeth does increase throughout its evolution. So it's not that Megalodon entirely got larger, but the maximum size of, Me of Megalodon's ancestors kept getting larger and larger as it was evolving. As it was evolving, the, the serrated edge became more uniform and even. These little lateral cusplets disappeared, and as they disappeared, the crown started to widen. As the crown is widening, that blade is actually getting flatter, and so is the root. Relative to the overall tooth size, if you look at Autotus, it has a very, very thick root. And it's gradually getting flattened out as you move from this kind of trident shape to a more blade-like tooth. So when you're wondering, uh, the, is serrations an important enough feature to, to warrant a different genus? Well, we can look at the evolution of the great white shark. And a lot of people probably recognize this and might think of it as Isurus histalis. This shark tooth used to be referred to as the broad tooth mako, which is Isurus, is the genus for mako sharks. But when Megalodon was pulled away from the great white lineage, people started to realize that this was likely the ancestor of the great white shark. And we were able to find this evolutionary progression that's fairly similar to Megalodon, where you gradually develop serrations until you get this kind of broadly triangular crown with a serrated edge. So if we're gonna use the same genus name in the great white shark's evolution, and the only difference between this species and this species of serrations, then the same precedent should hold true for Megalodon. So for that reason, uh, we are starting to change a lot of our exhibits to say Otodus Megalodon, because that falls in line with, with how we're treating the great white lineage. One thing I want you to keep in mind, because this will come into play later, these serrations developed around eight to five million years ago. So the earliest true great white sharks are, are somewhere in this range, about eight to six million years ago is probably the earliest great white shark. Um, the common name that would be more appropriate for this that rather than broad tooth mako would be extinct white shark, since we are now placing it in this lineage. With that, our, our two lineages are placed in two separate families. So Megalodon's lineage, the megatooth sharks, are in this family, Otodontidae and great white lineage and makos are placed in a separate family, uh, Lamnidae. So the last common ancestor between Megalodon and a great white shark was probably during the Cretaceous, more than 65 million years ago. 
So we went from thinking that these were directly related to one another to saying that their last common ancestor was more than 65 million years ago. So that's a pretty big change in our conception of how these sharks are related to one another. So we can see evidence of megalodon evolution along the Calvert Cliffs. So the Calvert Cliffs span from about 21 to seven and a half million years old. So with that time frame, we're getting the last two species of megalodon evolution. We get Otodus chubitensis, which has the small cusplets, and then we get Otodus megalodon, which does not have the lateral cusplets. So when I was an intern here at the Calvert Marine Museum, my research project was looking at the rate of evolution between these species. So basically, how long did it take for these lateral cusplets to fully disappear? So what I did is I looked at every megatooth shark we had from Calvert Cliffs in our collection and in the Smithsonian's collection that had very precise stratigraphic data. I needed to know where in the cliffs these came from to put it into this temporal context to look at this. And what we see is a very gradual trend of these cusplets disappearing, and it took a long time. It took roughly 10 million years for this final transition to occur. So you might argue that the loss of lateral cusplets relates to uh, the tooth becoming more blade-like and to be more efficient as a cutting tool. But if it's taking over 10 million years for that transformation to occur, that means there is not a very strong selective pressure for that to happen. So those little lateral cusplets probably weren't really impeding the shark's ability to feed on marine mammals. Instead, the reason those cusplets are disappearing is because that crown is widening. And as that crown is widening, those cusplets are essentially just becoming part of the overall cusp, the main, the main portion of the tooth. So why? Why did Megalodon change? It's exactly what I'm describing. Over a long term, we might say that there is this trend uh, becoming from more grasping-like, having a narrow cusp with these lateral cusplets and a very robust root. I would refer to that as a grasping type tooth. Think of it like a fork. You're grabbing and holding your food in place. As we are evolving, we develop serrations. Serrations first appear at the same time that marine mammals evolve. So this, to me, is a pretty good indicator that the reason these serrations were developed were to take advantage of this new prey source, this highly nutritious marine mammals that have just entered the marine realm. And through time, uh, the teeth are basically just becoming more efficient cutting tools. But again, it's taking a long time, 45 million years before we get to this final, you know, ideal cutting tool. So there probably wasn't a super strong selective pressure, but there was something driving this change through time. So again, we have lots of evidence. If you were able to come last week uh, for the last lecture that Stephen Godfrey gave, he showed a lot of different evidence of, of feeding done by Megalodon on marine mammals and other, other prey items. And that lecture is recorded, so if you'd like to go back and check that out, feel free. So again, Megalodon, cutting type teeth, which help it dismember prey. And the same is true of a great white shark. They both independently evolved teeth that are ideal for cutting. All right, now that we've kind of talked about where Megalodon came from, let's talk about how big Megalodon got. So you can go to a lot of museums, including our own, and see displays of a full-scale Megalodon. Uh, we have a skeletal reconstruction of Megalodon in our museum. The Smithsonian has kind of a fleshed out full-scale model of, of Megalodon. In Australia, Australia, they reconstructed just kind of the head of Megalodon. So how do these different museums come up with the size of Megalodon, right? How, how do we figure that out? First, we have to think about what the fossil record of Megalodon looks like. The vast majority of the fossil record is going to be teeth. On occasion, we will find vertebra, the centrum of, of Megalodon. However, we have never found centrum of Megalodon with the teeth. They've only found them independent of one another. So it's not as though we can simply measure from head to tail how long the shark was. We need to come up with methods where we can estimate size from either a tooth or a vertebra. So I grew up collecting along the Calvert Cliffs, and there was this common myth about how you could estimate body size in Megalodon. The myth I always heard was for every inch of tooth, that's roughly 10 feet of length. What I'm showing you here is an associated dentition of Megalodon. What that means is all of these teeth came from one shark. And what you notice is that they are not the same size. Towards the front of the jaw, you get your largest teeth, and they gradually get smaller as you work back towards the posterior region. 
So if I were to apply this method, every inch equals 10 feet of length, I would get an estimate of maybe 40 feet from the front, and I'd get an estimate of under 10 feet from the back of the jaw. So it, this method simply doesn't work because Megalodon did not have the same size teeth throughout its entire jaw. So there is a very popular method that was published in 2002 by a researcher named Kenshu Shimada. And what he did was he looked at the crown height, so just the height of the portion coated in enamel, he did not include the root, and compared that to the total length uh, in living great white sharks. He wanted to see if there was a relationship between the tooth height and body length. And what he suggested was, perhaps these same equations could be used to estimate body size of Megalodon. Even if they aren't directly related, as I said, they both independently developed these broadly triangular serrated teeth to feed on marine mammals. So ecologically, they were behaving very similarly, and we really don't have a better analog alive today. So even if they're not closely related, it's the best thing we have that's still alive today. So what he did, again, he looked at the height of the tooth versus the total length in living great white sharks, and he did that for each tooth position. So for every tooth position, there is a different linear equation uh, that you could apply. So all you need to do to apply this to Megalodon is measure the crown height and plug it in uh, for x here in this linear equation, and you can solve. The issue with that is you need to be able to identify an isolated tooth to its proper tooth position first, and I just showed you the shape change is very gradual from one tooth to the next. So it is really impossible to take an isolated tooth and know definitively the exact position it came from without having the other teeth for context. So I, uh, when I was at University of Florida for my PhD, I was working with some teachers and they wanted to do a lesson on estimating body size of Megalodon. And uh, a fossil collector, a very famous fossil collector named Gordon Hubble donated an associated dentition of Megalodon to the Florida Museum. We were able to bring that dentition to Duke University and CT scan it. Uh, and now those 3D files are freely available online on Morphosource, and a copy of that dentition is over on the table here if you'd like to check out after the talk. So for the lesson, the first thing the students do, we disperse the teeth to the students randomly, and we ask them to go up and try to arrange the dentition. So by doing this, because they only have the isolated tooth, they inevitably are gonna get some out of place. And once they start to see those teeth next to other teeth, they're like, they can tell that is not the right progression from large to small teeth. So they, they realize that you cannot identify accurately an isolated tooth to the exact position. But when you have an associated dentition, you have context to put the puzzle together. So we get the teeth in the proper order, and then the students uh, took measurements of the teeth and applied Kenshu Shimada's linear equations to estimate body size. So at the time when I created this lesson, I assumed that these equations worked. They were published in 2002, and they had repeatedly been used by other researchers uh, to estimate body size. But it turned out, no one actually tested these equations on an associated dentition before this lesson. So the students actually came up with a very interesting result. The anterior teeth, those at the front of the jaw, gave an average estimate around 44 feet. The lateral teeth gave an average estimate around 64 feet, and the posterior teeth gave an average estimate around 110 feet. So for this one shark using this method, the range of estimates was basically 40 to 148 feet. So that does not really tell us anything about the body size of this shark. So effectively, these students disproved a published scientific method, and it was completely serendipitous. Uh, we did not expect this to happen. But because of that, uh, I actually added a component to my dissertation where I collaborated with some researchers to develop a new method for estimating body size in Megalodon. And instead of using isolated teeth, we were using only associated dentitions, and rather than using the height, we were using the width of the teeth. The idea was the width of the teeth is gonna be constrained by the size of the jaw and would be a better proxy for estimating body size. And by using associated dentitions, we wouldn't have to worry so much about if we are accurately identifying a tooth to the exact position. Um, so what we did is we take a jaw and you divide it into four regions. You have your upper left, your upper right, your lower left, and your lower right. And the reason we do that is because even though they're an associated set of teeth, it's the fossil record. They're not entirely complete. There's often teeth missing from certain areas. And it also allowed us to compare estimates from the upper jaw versus the lower jaw to see if one's more reliable than the other. 
So essentially the way this works, we're still using a great white shark as our analog. Like I said, they may not be directly related, but it's the best thing that's alive today. So I can measure the width of these teeth from this modern great white shark. When that shark was caught, they measured the total length. Uh, from our fossil dentition, I can measure the width of these teeth. And I can calculate now for my unknown body length. There's four variables, three I can measure, and one I can calculate for. So this is the very basic math behind uh, our new method. So to confirm that there was a relationship between summed width and total length, we did basically the same thing that Shimada did. Instead of crown height, we're plotting upper summed crown width. So just one upper quadrant of the jaw versus its total length. And what you see here, this R squared value, that is correlation. So if they were directly related to one another, that R squared value would be one. That means that summed width perfectly predicts body length. But nature's not perfect, so it's slightly off. But 0.93 is still a very high correlation. Interesting thing, if we look at the lower dentition, it's still a strong correlation, but it is a little bit weaker, 0.89. So this already gives an indication that the upper jaw is gonna give us a better estimate than the lower jaw. I'm not gonna get into power functions, don't worry guys, we're just gonna stick with linear equations for tonight. Um, one other thing I want you to see is as this width is getting larger, as the total length is increasing, the variability is increasing. So as these sharks are developing and growing, there is more variability in the width of their teeth. That, th that makes perfect sense. Through time, more opportunity for, for various factors to affect your growth. So when you think about this, we also can look at a modern great white shark's dentition and compare that to our most complete fossil dentition of Megalodon. And there are a couple differences. So on average, a great white shark will have 24 teeth in the upper jaw and 24 teeth in the lower jaw. However, based on our most complete individual Megalodon, it had 24 teeth in the upper jaw and 22 teeth in the lower jaw. Another indicator that the upper jaw might be a better predictor for body length than the lower jaw. Another thing you'll notice is in the lower teeth, there's a wider gap between them. So what that means is there is more accommodation space for those teeth to grow. So there's more space available for variability in the lower jaw than there is in the upper jaw. The fact that those are closely packed in together, there's just not a lot of space for continued growth in the upper jaw. Another slight difference between uh, the dentitions is the third tooth here. So in the great white, this is referred to as an intermediate tooth, uh, and it's kind of reduced in size relative to the teeth in front and after it, and it actually slightly angles inward rather than, than backward. Um, Based on the associated dentitions we have found so far of Megalodon, it does not appear that, that Megalodon had that feature. Uh, it's possible that, let's say, this tooth is that intermediate and it belongs over here and we just reconstructed it wrong, but in terms of measuring summed width, it really doesn't matter if I put that tooth here or here, it's all gonna be summed together. So, as I mentioned, this is the most complete dentition of Megalodon known. This was found in Florida in the Bone Valley region, but it's still missing some teeth. So we have not actually found an entirely complete dentition of Megalodon yet. All right, so in order to test this method, I had four associated dentitions of Megalodon, and I had four associated dentitions of Megalodon's immediate ancestor, Otodus chubatensis. And again, like I said, there's a lot of gaps in here because these, it's the fossil record. We don't have everything perfectly preserved, we're often missing at least one or two teeth, and in many cases, we only have like half of the jaw preserved. So this one up here at the top, which is missing almost the entire right side here, is actually the one that's 3D printed over here. So all these teeth that are missing, all we did was we took these 3D files and we mirrored that. So that's how we created the entire set of teeth. We just assume that there is symmetry in the jaw and that this tooth is more or less gonna be equivalent to its counterpart on the other side. We also tested this in the great white lineage. So if we're using a modern great white shark as our analog, this method should work really well for estimating body size of fossil carcarodon individuals. So up here, A, this is a fossil dentition of a great white shark. Uh, B is the ancestor carcarodon histalis. And then here, this skeleton is actually the intermediate, the transitionary species called carcarodon hubbelli, named after Gordon Hubble. Um, so with this one, because it's actually preserved as a skeleton, 
we can compare our estimates from the teeth to the estimates we get based on the vertebra. So another way to kind of validate that our method is accurate. So in order to account for missing teeth in these dentitions, essentially what we did is looked at what proportion of the summed width does each position account for. So essentially what this is saying is that the first tooth in the jaw in a great white shark accounts for approximately 10% of the summed width. So if I'm missing that first tooth, I can now calculate an approximate width for that tooth using this. So A and B are based off of modern great white sharks. Uh, a is the upper and B is the lower dentition. C and D are the proportions based off our fossil dentitions of Otodus. So that's Megalodon and Chubitensis. So not surprisingly, because we're working with fossils, there is more variability in our, in our estimates for these. Um, and you can see there's even more variability when you get in the back of the jaw. So this kind of indicates that not only is the upper jaw the best estimator, but if you were to use isolated teeth, the anterior region, and actually right here, this lateral tooth um, has a pretty, pretty narrow range of variation. So the, those tooth positions could be good predictors if you had to use an individual tooth. All right, so I'm not gonna go through all of this, but essentially what I've shown here is a range of estimates. So if I'm estimating body size of this one shark, but I'm using 20 modern great white sharks, for each one of those modern great white sharks, I'm getting an estimate. So the range is based off of the different individuals I'm using, and we take our mean value as, as our best estimate. So for every single one of these dentitions, you'll notice that the lower jaw always results in a larger estimate than the upper jaw. And for the reasons I described earlier, we believe the upper jaw is the more accurate estimate. The other thing you'll notice, I'm going from smaller individuals to larger individuals, from bottom to top. And the range of estimates increases as you get larger. So the further we get away in size from a living great white shark, the more uncertainty we have in our estimate. And if you recall, in that linear graph I showed of summed width versus total length, as the sharks were getting larger, there was more variability. So again, this just follows the trend that we already kind of expected. So again, same kind of thing. This, now we're looking at the ancestor of Megalodon, Chubitensis. Every instance, the lower jaw results in an overestimate relative to the upper jaw. And same thing, as we increase in size, uh, the range of error is going to increase. And there is also a slight overlap in the body size of, of our Chubitensis individuals and our Megalodon individuals. Now let's look at the great white lineage. So even in the great white shark, we're using modern great whites to estimate body size of a fossil great white. Even in those sharks, lower jaws still uh, overestimate. So this, again, just kind of validates that the upper jaw is gonna be our more accurate uh, predictor of body size. And for these individuals, because they are close in size to our living great white sharks, the range of error is, is much smaller than, than the Otodus lineage. So our last one, again, we could compare our estimates from the teeth to the estimates from the vertebra. So we said our best estimate comes from the upper jaw. Our mean value is 4.9 meters. Based on vertebral estimates, the range was 4.7 to 5.2 meters, with the average being 4.9. We got the exact same answer. So this is, again, just validating that the upper jaw is our best predictor of, of body length. So now we can kind of compare this method, some crowned width versus the crown height method that Shimada employed. So first thing, just looking at some crown width, as I showed you, lower jaw always results in overestimate for every single individual. Um, Comparing the estimates from some crown width to crown height, you'll see that the range of error is much larger. So for this individual, look at the scale here. Uh, we're going from zero to 70 meters versus zero to 30 meters in this one. So some crown width offers much more constraint in terms of uh, body length. And as we said, the uncertainty is increasing as you go from small individual to a larger individual. So three takeaways we can, we can really pull away from that study. So this was um, one of the chapters of my dissertation. And the last thing we want to do is provide uh, a maximum estimate for Megalodon. So we had four individuals based on associated dentitions of Megalodon, 
four of the ancestor and three from the great white lineage. That is not a large enough sample size for the entire size range of any of those species. It's just a way to kind of develop the method. In order to get a maximum size, we need to use the largest known isolated tooth in Megalodon. So this tooth, on its slant height, is seven and a quarter inches. Um, it is the largest Megalodon tooth that I could verify and hold in my hand. There are images online of teeth that are larger, but I could not access those to, to validate that they weren't somehow modified. So this is the largest known tooth that I had access to. This red polygon, uh, inside of that area, the, the tooth enamel has been repaired, but as aside from that, everything about this is the original tooth. Uh, and this was actually found in South Carolina and is also in Gordon Hubble's collection. So when we were looking at the, the width of our megalodon teeth and the associated dentitions, the widest tooth was tooth position L1, so the first lateral. So if this is the largest known tooth of megalodon, we're going to assume that it is also the widest tooth in the jaw. So we're going to assume that it represents tooth position L1, which accounted for, on average, 10.5% of the summed width. So because I have that percentage and I can measure the width of that tooth, I can calculate what the sum would be of all these tooth positions. And using that calculation and our largest associated individual, we get an estimate of 20 meters or about 65 feet in length. So based on this study, the maximum body size of Megalodon would be 65 feet in length. Um, it, it, it would make Megalodon the largest shark to ever live, but it is quite close in size actually to the largest whale sharks which are about 60 to 62 feet in length as the largest living whale shark. But they have very, very different uh, ecology. Whale sharks are filter feeders. Megalodon have these serrated teeth for, for active predation and scavenging. So again, this, this was part of my research uh, for my dissertation, and this paper is published and freely available online. Uh, so you're welcome to check it out if you'd like to read it in more detail or get access to any of these images. All right, our last question for the evening. When did Megalodon go extinct? So I don't know if you, any of you have heard of PBS eons, but they do these kind of science communication videos, and they have one about Megalodon extinction. It's titled, Why Megalodon Definitely Went Extinct. Uh, so if you want uh, to watch a video that kind of covers a lot of the same things I'm talking about tonight, you can look this up, and it's freely available online. So first of all, what is the evidence that Megalodon is extinct? First and foremost, we don't have fossils of Megalodon from the last two to three million years. There's a couple occurrences of, of teeth that may have come from that range, uh, but they're not from definitive stratigraphic origin. It's not like we pulled it out of the cliff and we know for certain the age. Um, so we don't have a fossil record of Megalodon for, mo for millions of years. Pretty good indication that it's no longer around. Where Megalodon existed based off its fossils, it inhabited coastal environments. So that habitat overlaps with our fisheries, uh, a lot of people that work out on the water. It is very unlikely that in, in the last few million years that Megalodon completely changed its habitat and moved into some deep water environment that we simply haven't explored. So people often like to throw around, uh, only 10% of the ocean has ever been explored, so how can you know that Megalodon doesn't exist? Well, first of all, according to NOAA, 20% of the ocean has been explored, not 10. And secondly, um, Megalodon's habitat overlaps with the areas that we freq frequently are inhabiting as well. So we would expect to, to have encounters with it. And with that same thought, there wouldn't be speculative sightings. There would be definitive sightings. If you've got a fisherman out there chumming the water and you've got this massive shark swimming in the same area, it is not gonna swim away. It is gonna come explore that chum. So, there really wouldn't be any need to speculate about the existence of Megalodon. So there's two main papers that were published that discuss when did Megalodon go extinct. First one was published in 2016 by Catalina Pimiento and others. And essentially what they did in this study was they, they looked at the geographic range of Megalodon and, and they looked at all, all publications that, that name Megalodon and they verified those occurrences and looked at where they fit in time. 
The second study was published in 2019. And essentially what they did is they focused on uh, the Eastern North Pacific and they kind of vetted all of the data that was reported in this study and included a couple of other occurrences. Um, and they came to a slightly different conclusion. So let's look at, at these two papers. So the first paper in 2016, as I said, they wanted to first plot out where did Megalodon occur? What is the geographic range of Megalodon? So the blue dots are verified occurrences that they can confirm are correct. Yellow dots are what they refer to as dubious records that most likely are not accurate. Uh, either either it, the information on the card was incorrect, something about the, the information was not accurate. So from this map, you can see that Megalodon inhabited uh, global, uh, global oceans, right? It was all around the world. It also had a pretty um, high latitude tolerance. So it's not like it was restricted to warm waters in the tropics. It lived in temperate regions that, were, that had colder waters. And in fact, ancestors of Megalodon have even been found uh, in Antarctica. So the Megatooth lineage uh, has been found on every single continent. They lived globally, and they were capable of tolerating colder temperatures. So the next thing that this study did was they plotted out the geographic range through time. So the early Miocene to be about 20 million years ago, middle Miocene about 15 million years ago, late Miocene about 10 million years ago, Pliocene about five million years ago or so. And what you see is that the range did not really change that significantly through time. Megalodon continued to inhabit all the oceans uh, basically throughout its, its, life, its evolutionary history. The one thing that did change was the abundance of Megalodon teeth. So Megalodon's abundance peaks in the middle Miocene when climate was warmer. So the overall range of the shark may not have been affected by climate, but the abundance, the, how prolific they were in, in the seas at that time, was likely affected by climate. And with this, they found that Megalodon most likely went extinct at the end of the Pliocene, around 2.6 million years ago. So end of the Pliocene, start of the Pleistocene is when climate really started to get colder. So this kind of would suggest that if, if the extinction event happened at 2.6 million years ago, climate was probably involved because it just corresponds so well with the timing. So the second study that we're going to look at they actually found that Megalodon most likely went extinct around 3.6 million years ago. So about a million years before global climate started to really get a lot colder. Uh, essentially what they did is they looked at all of these occurrences, and again, remember, they were only looking in the eastern North Pacific. So they, they narrowed the, the scope, the geographic range of their study. Um, but they looked at all the occurrences and kind of tried to verify the data. And what they found is, all of the occurrences younger than 3.6 million years ago were either um, showed evidence of reworking, which means they're very tumbled and worn, so they were likely transported and redeposited. So along the Calvert Cliffs, as I said, they're about 20 to 7.5 million years old. On occasion, we'll find horn corals that are hundreds of millions of year, years old. And those got into those young deposits because the rivers are transporting sediment from the Appalachians down to the bay, and with those sediments, on occasion will come fossils. So older fossils are being reworked in to a younger geologic uh, strata. So the same was likely true for these occurrences of Megalodon in these formations. They were reworked into those formations. The other thing was many of the sites that they named, many of the formations, were inaccurately dated. So when they um, used the more appropriate dates, again, all of the verified occurrences of Megalodon were 3.6 million years ago or older. So one million year of time, in, in conception of all of geologic time, one million years is, is not a lot. But in terms of explaining why Megalodon went extinct, this has big implications about how well this correlates with climate. So if this happens well before this climatic event, it would indicate that there is some other explanation for why Megalodon went extinct. So the three main theories you will often hear for why Megalodon went extinct are competition, prey availability, and migration routes. So competition, as I showed you earlier, 
uh, in the great white lineage, around eight to five million years ago was when serrated teeth started to develop in the great white lineage. So they became more efficient at feeding on marine mammals around that time. So now Megalodon has to compete with this other shark that's capable of eating the same food, but requires a lot less food to survive. So in this sense, Megalodon's massive size would actually be a detriment. It'd be more difficult to maintain that body size because you require so much more food. So competition is likely the most uh, reasonable explanation for, for Megalodon's extinction. The next one you hear often is prey availability. So what we're looking at here is cetacean uh, generic diversity. So what's the total number of genera of cetaceans, whales and dolphins? It peaks in the middle Miocene. If you recall, that's when the abundance of Megalodon teeth peaks as well. So global climate warmed and prey was, was at its peak in terms of availability. So Megalodon was thriving at that time. Then you start to lose a lot of diversity. So the number of whales and dolphins out there was, was declining. So certainly, with more sharks capable of feeding on the same thing and less prey available, another reason that Megalodon may have gone extinct. Again, very difficult to maintain that massive body size if you can't get enough food. The last explanation you often hear is, is these migration routes. So, Around three to five million years ago is when Panama formed. And when Panama formed, it separated a marine connection from the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So at a, at a time, Megalodon had the ability basically to go from the Pacific into the Atlantic to kind of follow food, right? It would be very easy. It just had, it had more habitat available to it. But once that landmass forms and it separates these two oceans, the only way to get from one to the other would be to take this really southern route, very long journey, and you have to go through a very steep temperature gradient from maybe the tropics down into temperate, into polar regions and back around. So Megalodon may have been capable of that, but it's way more difficult than simply crossing through this, this tropical seaway. Um, there's also studies that have shown that there were nursery habitats around here, so if this seaway disappears, maybe that affect the nursery habitats as well. Um, so this, this probably played some role, and in fact, most likely all three of these things had some role, but I would say that based off the timing of the extinction, competition was the biggest factor. And the great white shark wasn't the only other predator at that time capable of feeding on marine mammals. There were other, there were other species capable of doing that. So if you're gonna be that big and have to deal with other predators feeding on the same food source, uh, you're gonna go through a tough time. So with that, to answer our three questions from, from this evening, uh, so who did Megalodon evolve from? Megalodon evolved from Otodus obliquus and is not directly related to the great white shark. Uh, in terms of why, Megalodon's evolution is likely closely tied to the evolution of marine mammals. They evolved this larger size and these serrated teeth in order to prey upon this new food source. Megalodon likely reached a maximum body size of 65 feet or 20 meters. Uh, and again, this increase in size was likely correlated with the evolution of marine mammals. As marine mammals were evolving, they were also increasing in size, and Megalodon was doing the same. So it's often referred to as an evolutionary arms race between predator and prey. Finally, based on the most recent study, it seems that Megalodon went extinct during the Pliocene around 3.6 million years ago, so about a million years prior to that global cooling event when the Pleistocene glaciation started. And again, Megalodon's extinction was likely driven by competition with other predators, as well as prey availability, perhaps climate, and, and changes in geography. So please come back and visit our sharks exhibit. And with that, I'll gladly answer any questions you all have. In, in paleontology, we have what's called lumpers and splitters. Lumpers tend to group things together uh, and will have fewer species in a lineage. Splitters will split things more finely when, when features occur, so they'll have more species in a lineage. So there are people that, when you have a partially serrated crown, they, they give it a different species name, um, Axoaticus. So what they're saying is the presence of serrations is not a significant enough feature to warrant a different genus, so the entire lineage should be referred to as a totus. So regardless if you are a splitter or a lumper, um, 
in their mindset, the entire lineage should be called a TOTUS. So you continue to split the species, but they should still all be grouped in the same genus. So within that lineage, the ancestors of Megalodon, beyond a TOTUS, they did have symphysial teeth. So within the genetic code for Megalodon, it exists, the ability to produce a symphysial tooth. So it's not unlikely that some individuals would be oddities and, and develop a symphysial tooth, but I would not consider it part of the typical dentition. Amongst all the associated dentitions we have found so far, none have any symphysial teeth. So um, I would not consider it to be the norm, but it, it could exist. So for example, I have an irregular dental count, and as do a lot of people, uh, wisdom teeth, right? I had four wisdom teeth removed. Uh, about three years ago, I went to the dentist and I got an x-ray done. Turns out I had a fifth wisdom tooth. So even though I say great white sharks had 24 teeth in the upper and 24 in the lower, that is on average. Amongst the living individuals we saw, uh, it actually ranged from, I would say, 22 to, I think, 27 teeth in the upper jaw. So it is not, it is not stuck within one template they can produce more or less teeth than, than the norm. Yep, in those eight associated dentitions, we have not found any kind of symphysial tooth. Yeah, but I have seen teeth that I would call symphysial teeth, and I know that the ancestors of, of Megalodon in the Cretaceous did have symphysials, so uh, it, it does not surprise me that, it, that that information is stored within the genetic code, that it could produce that. And I mean, during the, I would say, during the late Pliocene and into the Pleistocene, whales were going through many extinctions in themselves. So if we chose one whale species, there's a chance that neither won the arms race, they both lost. Um, certainly climate was a factor. So one of the things I didn't mention, uh, one of the theories for why Megalodon went extinct was that as climate was getting colder, whales adapted the ability to go into these colder polar regions. So they would make these, these migrations into colder waters. Uh, and that Megalodon could not tolerate that, those cold temperatures. But as we showed with the geographic range of Megalodon, it, it can tolerate relatively cold temperatures. So that probably wasn't a good explanation for, for why it went extinct. But it certainly played a factor. Um, I mean, you could go through these, these feedback loops of saying, as, as climate uh, got colder, your primary producers started to either decrease or increase, and that just has effects that cascade through, through the ecosystem. Um, so undoubtedly, indirectly, climate was a factor, but it does not seem to be the direct cause of extinction for Megalodon. Um, the, the breathing apparatus, I, I'm not so sure how breathing air versus water would necessarily affect it. All I can say is that uh, the effects of climate are, are a little bit weaker in water than they are on land. That water acts as a buffer, so your changes in temperature are not gonna be as significant in the water as they will be on land. Um, but in terms of, of breathing from the air versus breathing the water, I'm not, I'm not so sure how that would uh, be involved. Sure. Um, so, Yes, there will be size differences between your functional tooth in the, in the front row and your file replacement teeth in the back. Um, our best guess right now is that Megalodon had five rows of teeth. Uh, we have associated dentitions where we do have replacement teeth. For that study, I did not attempt to do any kind of body size estimate with what I interpreted as, as replacement teeth, but it was something I did consider because we have um, multiple teeth, perhaps we could get some kind of growth series or even calculate a replacement rate for the teeth. Um, so I would say that there is room for study there. Uh, it just simply has not been explored. Uh, I think by the fourth or fifth tooth, you're typically only gonna get an enamel cap. The root has not yet formed, so you certainly could not get an accurate estimate from just an enamel cap. Um, and those teeth are gonna kinda of continue to develop. I'm not sure if like the second tooth row is fully developed at that point or if it, it still continues to grow all the way until it's replaced. But there are associated dentitions with file teeth, so, so you could do exploratory studies with that. Anterior teeth will get you fairly close with that, with that approximation. Um, but 
just close, just close. <laughs> so in terms of our evidence for what Megalodon was feeding on, we, we're gonna look for bite traces on bone, right? You think about a whale skeleton, much larger bone than, than a, a bony fish, right? And, and much more robust. So the likelihood of that bite trace preserving on a whale bone is a lot greater than the bite trace preserving on a fish bone. So when I think of Megalodon, this massive predator is easily capable of feeding on pretty much anything out there. But in terms of our fossil record, what we have is evidence of Megalodon feeding on, on cetaceans, more or less. Uh, we don't really have, I can't think of a single fish bone, a bony fish, where we have definitive bite marks that we could say that came from Megalodon. But, say again? Yeah, I have never seen definitive evidence of a Megalodon bite on a turtle either. But I suspect still that they, on a, I'm sure in, in the evolutionary history of Megalodon, at least one of those guys ate a turtle at some point, decided whether they liked it or not. I would assume, but in, in terms of validating that through the fossil record, I have yet to see it. So even on the, what is Megalodon's menu, I included turtles, but I have not seen the definitive evidence for that. That is, that is more or less my assumption. We, we do have evidence of, of scavenging versus active predation. We can say that, that there are instances in which Megalodon was actively preying upon cetaceans versus simply scavenging. Um, but we, we really don't have enough information in the fossil record to definitively say if Megalodon's diet was, was restricted to cetaceans. I mean, I would also assume that Megalodon ate other sharks, but the cartilage just simply doesn't preserve well enough for me to validate that in the fossil record. Are we shark tooth fairies? I kind of like that. I'll add that to my byline, shark tooth fairy. See, you're gonna start finding a lot of shark teeth in the, in the bed. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well thank you all for coming. Uh, please feel free to come check out the 3D printed dentition. Uh, my business card's over there if you'd like to take one and you're welcome to email me anytime. <laughs>